Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's webinar on studying in the USA. My name is Holly Haig and I am an Education USA advisor here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. I'm going to briefly take a moment to introduce myself before we jump into some of our content this evening. Um, so I'm joined by my colleague Sarah who will come up and introduce herself later on in the presentation. Um, but as I said, my name is Holly. Um, a bit of my background and connection to US study is that, as you can probably tell from my voice, I'm originally from here in the UK, from up in Liverpool. Um, but I did my undergraduate degree in the USA, so was in your shoes many moons ago and can really vouch for that, um, you know, US study being such an incredible and transformative experience. OK, so in this session, we are going to cover off um, some of those broad themes to help you get started on your, exploring your U.S. study options. We're going to first of all talk about choosing a university in the U.S., then talk about funding as well as putting together an application. Another housekeeping piece that I want to add um, we are going to be having a Q&A section at the end of this presentation. So if you do have questions, please hold them towards the end. Um, and hopefully Sarah and I will answer some of those off during the most part of this presentation. And if you could use the Q&A box to, to send those in to us. This session is also being recorded. So please feel free to make some notes, um, but don't feel like you need to frantically write down every single word we say, because we'll also be sharing a copy of the recording um, with you in the coming days. Next slide, please. All right, so I quickly, before we dive into some of that content, want to talk to you about what Education USA is and what the US UK Fulbright Commission, sort of who we are and how we might be able to help you. So some of you may be familiar with the US UK Fulbright Commission. This organization that we work for was established around 70 years ago in the aftermath of World War II by Senator Fulbright. Senator Fulbright was a US Senator um, who had studied abroad himself in the UK and thought that the best way to avoid a third world war from happening would be to encourage cultural and educational exchange um, and sort of peace and intercultural understandings through education. And so that is exactly what we at the US UK Fulbright Commission aim to do in our work. And so we're a non-for-profit organization jointly funded by the US and UK government to do exactly that, to promote peace and cultural understanding through educational exchange. Uh, the sort of section of our organization that Sarah and I represent is what is known as our Education USA Advisory Service. Um, and so what we do is as part of the US State Department, we provide free, up-to-date and non-biased information to help UK students to apply to universities and colleges in the US. And so we form part of a global network of over 600 advisors in more than 400 centres around the world. So if it is your dream to go out and study in the USA, that is what we're here to help with. Um, and so we are the only official source of US study information here in the UK. Next slide. OK, so with all of this in mind, let's start off by talking about what are some of the top reasons that UK students choose to study in the US. All right, so up on screen, we have got just six reasons why thousands of British students choose to study in the US uh, each and every year. By no means is this an exhaustive list, and I'm sure that those of you who are tuning in this evening also have your own ideas to add to this, but I'm just going to briefly run through some of the common reasons that we see students heading to the US. First off is reputation and variety of US institutions. As compared to here in the UK, where we have about 120 universities, in the US there are over 4,500 universities offering undergraduate degrees. With this in mind, there is a huge range of personality and style when it comes to different US universities. So you can really find something that um, fits in with what you want to get out of your time at university and, um, you know, really fits in with what you're about. I'd also caution here that there are a lot of um, really excellent universities in the US. And although we recommend using rankings with a big pinch of salt um, and to kind of consider a range of factors when you're looking at US universities, there is no denying that, you know, there are many high quality universities in the US. Five of the top 10 
uh, global rankings of universities in 2018 were made up of US universities. And many of these you may not have even have heard of. So there is a lot of really great institutions and a lot of variety amongst them. The US also offers an amazing opportunity to experience campus life and activities. US universities are known for having a really vibrant campus life and there is a real encouragement for students to be involved in many different ways outside of the classroom alongside their studies. So, you know, you might have seen this in films from, you know, Pitch Perfect, for instance, getting involved in a cappella groups, you might be getting involved in sports or um, any other extracurricular activities, volunteering, you name it, it's going to be out there in the US for you to explore and to try. Another real pull for UK students to the US comes um, in, in its ac academic flexibility that it offers. Um, US universities follow an educational style called a liberal arts curriculum. And what this means is that when you apply to a US university, you are not necessarily committed to studying one particular subject. Instead, you normally apply to the university as a whole rather than to, let's say, the history department. And so what that means is you will study a range of different subjects in combination um, during your degree. And there's this real emphasis on having flexibility to explore interests before selecting a major area of um, study, usually towards um, the end of your second year of your degree program. Um, Alongside this sort of academic flexibility, you'll also see a big emphasis on teaching in the US, um, really getting engaged in a classroom environment. And you'll also see a diverse range of classmates in your different uh, classes that you're taking because of this liberal arts style curriculum. In your you know, anthropology class, you might be sitting next to someone who studies biology while you study French. Um, so you're getting a real diverse perspective inside the classroom as well. Fourth on the list are funding opportunities. Now this often comes as a surprise to some of our students because there is a big misconception that US um, study is always very expensive, uh, but we'll discuss this later on, but there are actually many opportunities to find funding opportunities, particularly if you are flexible about where it is that you apply in the US. Studying in the US is also a wonderful way to internationalize your CV and could help you out later down the line when you're looking for employment. Often employers cite studying abroad as a really attractive quality in their applicants because it shows that sort of boldness to do something different um, and often has some of those skills like interpersonal skills and cross-cultural communication that are really highly sought after in the employment market. Um, you'll also see that by studying in the US, you'll build a really strong network of friends and professional contacts, not only in the US, but often globally, uh, because the US is such a hub for higher education. Um, and in terms of employment opportunities whilst you're on campus, um, students on a US student visa can work up to 20 hours a week during term time and 40 hours a week during the holidays. And so it may well be that you are able to take up an on-campus job while you're studying um, to build up that experience as well. And last but not least, studying in the US is offers this great opportunity to learn about a new culture. It's one thing to read about the US in a classroom, it's another to actually go out there and live there and experience it firsthand. Um, the US is a massive country spanning six different time zones and has a huge variety of you know, geography and cultures to explore. And that coupled with often quite long summer breaks, um, you know, there's this real opportunity to get to know US culture and to connect with Americans as well. All right, next slide. Okay, I'm gonna quickly run through now some of the key differences between what we see at US universities and what we see in U UK universities, just so that you, are set up going into the, the next sections of this presentation. First and foremost is the duration of programmes. On the previous slide, we talked about um, the liberal arts style of education. And so you'll typically see as a result of this uh, that programmes are slightly longer in the US. 
Whereas here in the UK, we typically have three year long undergraduate programs. In the US, most bachelor's degrees are four years in length. Similarly, as I mentioned, when you're applying to a US university, you are not necessarily applying directly to the history department, let's say. Instead, you're normally applying to the university as a whole. With this in mind, you might apply saying, oh, I've got an interest in studying history, but it doesn't commit you to being a student of the history department. Instead, you are studying a range of different subjects. I also want to add here that there are no set fees or deadlines when it comes to US universities. The US is the land of the free, and they really take that quite literally when it comes to university applications. Unlike UCAS that we have here in the UK, where everything is on one system, um, where most of the deadlines are pretty standardized, and we pretty much know how much universities are going to cost, regardless of where they are in the country. Each US university sets its own fees and deadlines. So you want to be really careful here um, as you're doing your university research to really identify, okay, when do I need to have this document in by and what is this going to cost me? So it's really important to be aware of that going into this process. I've also put up here that um, if funding is a consideration for you, it's important to think about it from the beginning of your research process rather than once you've already been admitted. We'll talk about this in some more depth um, as we talk about choosing a university and also funding US study but I just want to stress it from the beginning. Um, usually funding opportunities, um, applying for those goes hand in hand with applying for admission. And so you don't want to you know, get accepted into your dream school and then think about how to fund it, like how we might do it here in the UK, because normally at that point, all of the funding will have been allocated to other students and you don't want to be disappointed and get to a stage where you've been admitted but aren't able to go and pursue US study because you've not got the funding behind you. And then also just want to flag a couple of exceptions. Um, both law and medicine cannot be studied at the undergraduate level in the USA. These are only offered as postgraduate programs. And if you do have an interest in either of these subject areas, we're happy to answer any questions about them during the Q&A section at the end. Okay, again, very briefly before I talk a little bit more about choosing a university in the US, I've just put up on screen some key terminology differences that you're going to see when looking on US university websites and doing your choosing and research process. So what we call secondary school here in the UK, or perhaps years 10 to 13, are going to be known as high school and grades nine to 12 in the USA. You're going to hear Sarah and I use the terms college, university, school and institution interchangeably throughout this presentation, I would imagine. All of them mean uni or university, as we call it here in the UK. What we would call a module um, in the UK is known as a class or a course. And likewise, what we know as a course in the UK is known as a degree programme or a major. So just important to keep abreast of these differences as you're doing your research so that you know what the US universities are talking about on their websites. Okay, next up, we have got a brief timeline of how the US application process works. Um, the first step is really to research universities. And from personal experience, I am can really attest to this being probably the most important part of the process. We recommend that this whole process should take somewhere between one year to 18 months. Um, and so if you are currently in year 12 or equivalent, now is a good starting time um, if you are planning to start your studies straight after finishing year 13. Um, so yeah, we plan, we would recommend beginning the process of researching universities sort of 12 to 18 months before you plan to start your studies. Then um, going into sort of summertime after year 12, you'll want to be registering for any required admissions exams and aiming to take those sort of in the summertime. 
Moving into the late summer, early autumn, you'll want to finalise a selection of somewhere between six and ten universities that you'll ultimately apply for. And you'll begin to put together an application um, and submit those according to the individual university's deadlines. Moving forward then, um, sort of somewhere between four to seven months before you plan to head to the US in the springtime, you'll start to receive admissions decisions back from the universities that you've applied to about whether you've been accepted. Um, and then based on those decisions, you will decide on where it is that you'd like to attend and notify the universities. About a month to three months before you plan to head to the USA is when you'll apply for your US student visa. Um, and then after that, it, now is a great time to kind of have a look on our website at our pre-departure information or potentially attend um, one of our pre-departure webinars to learn more and help you feel prepared. And then typically a little bit earlier than you'd see for a UK programme, sort of mid-August to early September is when you will head to the USA to begin your studies. All right, so that's a bit of an introduction in terms of some of the things it's important to kind of get to grips with. Now I'm going to talk a bit more in depth about choosing a US university, because as I said, it is a really important step in the process of applying. As I mentioned earlier on, there are over 4,500 universities in the US. So that can seem like a lot, um, but in this section, we're going to talk through some ways and strategies about how you can narrow down your options. All right, so before we dive into this, I just want to quickly highlight again some of the key things to be aware of as you're going into your choosing process. There is a huge variety and diversity of institutions in the USA. Um, and so really be open-minded and flexible as you go into this process. For example, you don't want to only be looking at, you know, big research universities that you've heard of and are familiar with, because by doing so, you might miss out on some really great options for you, like a small liberal arts college. If you're a female identifying student, you might miss out on a women's college or a historically black college or university. So there is just a plethora of options. And so going into this process with an open mind can really help you to find the best fit university for you. As I mentioned on a previous slide, and Sarah will mention it again later on, make sure that you are considering funding during your choosing and research process. Not all universities are able to offer funding to international students. And so if funding is an important consideration for you, it's important to be looking for that as you do your research. You don't want to get to a situation where you're accepted into your dream school and then you know, come sort of the spring, summertime, you write to Sarah and I looking for funding. And at that point, it might be too late. So we don't want for you to be disappointed. It's important to consider it from the start. We would also recommend having a UK backup plan during your studies. Um, it is absolutely okay to apply to both US and UCAS at the same time. Um, and so in case, you know, the US application process doesn't work out how you would like to. It's always a good idea to have some UK applications out there as well. Okay. I've now got on screen um, this idea of fit. And this is something that we focus on a lot here at Education USA. And what we mean by fit is how does a US university fit what your needs are and what you want to get out of your time at university? But likewise, how do you fit in with the university and what they're offering? Um, and so there are a huge range of factors that go into your personal fit. And it, as I say, this is going to be quite a personal um, thing for each student to determine but it's really about locating factors that are most important to you to get out of your US university experience. So it might be, you know, things like types of programs and the departments that are on offer. It might be to do with the location of the university. Um, you know, if you really don't like the snow, perhaps the Midwest or the Northeast aren't the best fit for you. 
Um, but you'll also might include things like availability of funding. So what we would encourage you to do is to begin thinking about factors that are most important to you and to broadly prioritize what they are, you know, do you want to be in a really big university where you have, you know, a really real sense of sort of um, campus culture and things like that? Or would you like to be in a more close knit like college campus where you have a real small, small town a sort of feel to it, where you have really close connections with professors and faculty and things like that? Are you trying to save some money? Do you want to perhaps live in a more rural or suburban place, therefore, rather than sort of slap bang in an urban centre? You may also, um, you know, think about rankings in this, as we talked about before, but I really want to encourage you to think more broadly about all of these different pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, rather than fixating on perhaps just universities that you have heard of. And you wanna make sure that you are really putting in the time to research what's out there um, and having a look at universities where you could really see yourself being for four years if you were offered a place. Next slide, please. Okay. So now that you have sort of identified some of those key factors in determining your fit, um, what you're then going to do is have a look at what types of institutions are available and begin researching your options and narrowing down that list of over 4,500 institutions that we were talking about before. Unlike here in the UK through UCAS, there is no limitation on how many universities in the US that you can apply for. Um, in theory, you could apply to as many as you like, um, from a sort of finance, time and, you know, health perspective, we don't recommend that you do that. We recommend that you should focus on and narrowing down your options initially to somewhere between 10 and 20 universities that you're interested in and would like to dive in and do some more in-depth research on. And then from there, you'll ultimately narrow down your list further to somewhere between six and 10 universities that you will submit an application to. So with that in mind, how do you go about narrowing down your options? We're going to go through um, an example of what this looks like on just one search engine that we've got linked on our website. Okay. Great. So as I mentioned just now, on our website, we have got an online guide to choosing a U.S. university. Um, and one search engine that is linked in that guide is called Big Future College Search. And as you can see up on screen, there are a variety of different factors that you can filter by, including location, major, um, you know, campus life, etc. And so um, Thinking back to what you had identified as factors that were important to you, you can go ahead and add different criteria um, and filters in your search to narrow down your options further. An important note as well, which we'll talk about on the next slide, is that there is an affordability tab um, and you can, within that, add under financial need met the percentage of finances that you would need to be covered. Um, and then when you go into the individual university profiles, you want to double check whether or not that is available for international students and go onto the university website for the most up-to-date information. But yes, we'll go onto the next slide and show you a bit more how to do this. So on this slide, we have then gone ahead and added some filters based on the initial search. At the beginning of the process, um, before you've added any filters, there are over 3,800 universities on Big Future College Search, but we've added that we want to attend a four-year school that is small or medium-sized, located in Ohio, which again helps you to explore some other options out there in the States that you may not consider first, uh, first of all. And also that we will meet 100% of financial need, as I was saying about in the previous slide. And so right away, we have brought down 3,800 universities 
to just four universities, which is a lot more manageable and gives us a great starting point. Next slide. From there, we've gone ahead and clicked into Denison University, and you'll see that there's each university has then got its own profile to find information like application deadlines, and there's also a link to their website. Um, so this is just a really great starting point and tool to be able to then narrow down your search and explore the different options that are available to you. Okay, so once you've narrowed down those options, you'll again want to go onto the university websites for more specific information. And you might even want to reach out directly to the international admissions officer, um, as they're going to be the person who are best placed to help you. And as we said before, your main goal then is to select somewhere between six and 10 institutions where you'll actually go ahead and submit an application. Within that six to 10 um, universities, we recommend a good spread of competitiveness to really maximize your chances of securing both admission and funding. So within that, we recommend that you have two what we call REACH schools, where you'd be absolutely you know, made up to attend, but it would be a challenge for you to be accepted. Um, note that if you're applying to sort of ultra competitive universities, your Yale, Stanford, Caltech, MIT, etc., these are reach schools for absolutely everyone, regardless of their academic performance or extracurricular involvement. So you'd have two sort of reach schools. You then have three to four match schools, which are schools where your profile is roughly on par with their average admitted applicant. You then think about having two what we call likely admittance schools, which you can kind of think of as your UCAS insurance choice. These are schools that you know, your application would be very competitive at and you'd be surprised if you weren't offered a place. Um, and so as part of your research process then and sort of identifying these universities, you'll want to be looking on their websites, especially now um, during COVID, universities have a massive amount of virtual offerings, whether that's campus tours, virtual information sessions, um, lots of information about student life and activities. And you'll also find information on more practical things that we've talked about, like funding and finding accommodation and housing. You also might want to check out what resources they have specifically for international students. Another great way to get in touch with universities and to learn more about them um, is to follow their social media channels, whether that's Instagram or Facebook or even YouTube or TikTok. Um, you can really get a feel for the college and its personality and what they're focused on. Um, you may also want to talk with teachers, professors in the field that you want to pursue and get their advice on whether or not this might be a good fit program for you and what it is that you'd like to achieve in the future. We also recommend, you know, reaching out directly to the international admissions offices. As we said, in the US, it looks good for you and your application to be expressing your interest to the admissions offices. They really want to hear from you. So feel free to reach out to them via email or perhaps schedule a call with them. Um, to ask you know, specific questions that perhaps you can't find answers for on, on the website. A caution here is that it will have the most impact if those emails and communications are coming from you. Um, you know, top universities are not going to be impressed by your mom or dad calling on your behalf. Um, so that's kind of some top tips for university research. Um, and we'll have the next slide, please. I'm now going to show you just three examples of some universities and colleges in the USA that perhaps you've not heard of, but that showcase the sort of variety that is out there um, that you might want to look into more. So if you're looking for a competitive school that is small and collaborative and offers research opportunities, you might consider a small liberal arts college like Middlebury College in Vermont, which is known for its being a liberal and artsy area of the USA and for having beautiful waterfalls and hiking opportunities. If you are a female student who loves palm trees and sunshine, you might consider looking into Scripps College, which is an all women's college located in Claremont, California. And finally, if you want to experience some good old Southern hospitality, warm weather and country music, 
you might look at Vanderbilt University, which is a private research university in Nashville, Tennessee. So as you can see, there is a huge variety of institutions out there. We've just picked three to highlight to you this evening. So it's really important to put in the time to do that research. OK, before I hand over to Sarah to talk some more about funding and putting together an application, I quickly want to go through a quick note on the Ivy League, because it's something that we get a lot of questions about here at Education USA. The Ivy League is historically a sports league that is set up between the eight oldest universities in New England, and it is not an equivalent to the UK Russell Group. Um, there is no sort of becoming an Ivy League, and there are many wonderful institutions that I'm sure many of you have heard of, think MIT or Stanford, that are not part of the Ivy League, nor will you know, become part of the Ivy League. Instead, as I say, it's only made up of private research institutions. In only looking at universities that are part of the Ivy League, you might then be um, kind of limiting your options quite a lot and missing out on opportunities that are a really great fit for you. Um, so that's kind of one part of this puzzle. Um, you know, liberal arts colleges, like some of the ones we've mentioned just now, are also extremely competitive, offer really great undergraduate research opportunities um, and are really great quality schools. Um, and then, as we've said earlier on in the presentation, although we mentioned to keep rankings and things like that um, with, with a pinch of salt, I also want to highlight that with there being so many universities in the USA, um, if you take sort of the top 1% of US universities, you're looking at somewhere about 40 or 45 schools, as compared to the top 1% of UK universities, which consists of maybe one, possibly two schools. Um, and so within that, if you're only looking literally at the top 1%, you're looking at a huge range of institutions, um, not just those eight. Um, and so it's important to go into that with that flexibility and look into other universities that perhaps you've not necessarily heard of just yet, but are kind of household names in the USA. Also want to add here that um, the Ivy League institutions are extremely competitive. Um, last year, Harvard's acceptance rate was less than 5% as compared to Oxford and Cambridge, which sits somewhere around the 20% mark. Um, and so just to flag that Ivy League is, whilst it consists of some really excellent institutions, are by no means the only excellent institutions that may well be a good fit for you in the USA. Okay, so I think that concludes our section on choosing a US university. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who's gonna to talk to you some more about funding US study. Thank you, Holly. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I am an Education USA advisor at the Fulbright Commission. And as you might be able to tell from my accent, I am not originally from the UK. I am from Chicago. And I actually completed my undergraduate degree at DePaul University in Chicago, and then completed my master's at Northwestern University, um, just outside of Chicago in Evanston. Um, and, but I've been living in London for the past seven years now, and have been working at the Fulbright Commission for the past four years, and am delighted to be here helping you all today with your dreams of studying in the U.S., um, another quick caveat for me is that I am unfortunately suffering from terrible hay fever today. So I do apologize in advance if I have a bit of a cough or uh, a bit of a clearing of my throat or any sneezing uh, during my part of the presentation. I hope that you can excuse me. Um, and I hope that if you are uh, suffering from hay fever as well, that uh, we can all uh, overcome this soon. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about funding your studies and as you might imagine, this is something that we get asked about quite a bit at Fulbright. It's kind of one of the, the top questions that we get, how do we fund your studies? And so I'm really excited to, to speak to you about this today. I'd like to be upfront both about the costs of studying in the US, but also the ways that you are able to pay those costs and cover those costs to make your dream of studying in the US a reality. 
And so the first thing that I want to talk about is the costs that you can expect when studying at a U.S. university. And so the first thing to keep in mind is actually just the cost of applying to a U.S. university. And so if you need to sit an admissions exam for the universities that you're interested in applying to, um, there's going to be a cost of about $100 to $200 um, per exam. And so that's a cost that you'll want to keep in mind. There's also going to be an application fee for every university that you apply to that's usually about $50 to $100 per application fee, although some universities will um, have fee waivers that you can apply for. And then if you are accepted at a U.S. university, then you will also have to keep in mind the cost of the visa and the SEVIS fees. And the SEVIS fee is just, um, SEVIS is essentially the international student database that the Department of Homeland Security uses. So that's just something that they charge a fee for. And then for university itself, there's obviously going to be the cost of tuition and fees. And unlike the UK, there's no set tuition um, or no set fees in the US. And so every university is going to have different costs um, similar to the UK. There will be different costs depending on where you are living in the US. And so the cost of living is going to be different. Um, but one of the things that you can do is go to each university's website. And on that website, they will list the cost of attendance. And this is going to include not only the tuition and fees, but it's also going to include room and board. It could include other expenses like books um, and uh, books is the one that comes to mind, um, oh, flights uh, to and from university. And, and so when you see the cost of attendance, they really do try to keep in mind the whole cost of going to university. Um, but another thing that you'll want to keep in mind is also the cost of living of the university that you apply to, as well as any other expenses. So while the cost of attendance will include room and board, it might not include money for eating out or for clothing or entertainment. Uh, some universities will include health insurance in their cost of attendance and some universities won't. So that's something else that you'll kind of want to keep in mind. So those are some of the costs to expect uh, when applying to a U.S. university. So the good news is, is that there is a lot of funding available. Um, the caveat is that you have to be willing to put in the time and the research to get this funding. So if funding is important to you, as Holly has been saying, as, as you'll hear me say as well, it's important to include this in your process from the very beginning, including it in that research process and ensuring that you are applying to universities that can offer funding and also making sure that you're applying for all funding opportunities that are available to you. And if you're willing to put in the time and effort, it is possible to fund your studies um, with, without even having any loans. And so now I kind of want to take you quickly through the four main sources of funding, and then I'll go into more depth of a couple of these. And so one of the main sources of funding U.S. University is actually personal and family funds. And so in the U.S., uh, a lot of families do just kind of help fund uh, what they can towards a, their student, their, their children's university education. And it's something that um, a lot of parents think about from when their child is very young, that if their student is going to go to university, if their kid is going to go to university, they kind of start setting aside money and they start thinking about that. So if a family can afford to do that, then they will do that. And a university will expect that a family makes a contribution um, based on what they are able to afford to a U.S. university. So that's the personal and the family funds. Then another huge source of funding um, for U.S. universities is the U.S. universities themselves. So we'll talk about this in more depth uh, on the next slide, but that basically refers to need-based aid and merit-based scholarships. So as you might imagine, need-based aid is going to be based on your family's income level, and then merit scholarships will be based on your uh, merits. Another huge source of funding can be the external funding bodies, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then lastly, uh, one source can be loans. Now we talk about loans with a huge caveat here, and that this should really be your kind of last resort if you need to use it. And the reason for this is that you cannot take your UK student loan with you to the US and you will not be eligible for US uh, student loans unless you have dual US citizenship or unless you have a US citizen or a US resident that will co-sign a loan for you. And so 
with that in mind, if you do have to get loans, you would likely have to get private loans here in the UK, which can have really high interest rates and really um, strict payback terms, maybe even requiring to start paying back your loan before you've completed your studies. And so we really do kind of advise loans as a, a, as a last resort and that you do it with caution after exhausting all other options and only if necessary. And it's likely that you'll probably use a variety of all these different options to, to pay for university. It might not be that you're just using one of them, but you might be using a combination to pay for university in the US. So now I'd like to talk a little bit more about university funding. And this is really an ideal type of funding because it's uh, usually given in the form of grants. It's paid for by the university, which means that you don't have to pay it back. And so one of that, the types of funding is need-based aid which is based on your family's income level. And what the university will do is they will, you will complete a form that kind of um, gives them information about your family's finances. And using that information, they will calculate what your expected family contribution is. And then they will look at the cost of attendance and then they will try to meet that gap. So um, if for instance, the university costs $60,000 a year, and your family can only afford to pay $20,000 a year, then you will have this gap of $40,000 per year. And the university will try to meet that gap. Now, some universities are able to meet only 20% of that gap. Some universities might be half 50% of that gap. And then some universities can meet 100% of that. So they would say, oh, we can you know, give you the other 40,000 that you would need to attend. Um, and so that's something that you're gonna want to keep in mind. And one of the things that Holly was talking about when she showed you that search engine is that if you're looking for funding, it might be that you may only want to look at universities that are going to meet 100% of that, that need um, that, you, that you require in order to go to a US university. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the, another type of scholarship is merit-based scholarships. So this can often be in the form of maybe academic merit, that you have very high marks and they give you a merit scholarship scholarship based in that. It could be in something else merit-based, like a particular talent in musical instrument, for instance. Um, and there's also sports scholarships. So if you play sports to a, a certain sport at a very high level, it might be that you might be eligible for a sports scholarship. And we have more information about that on our website, if that's something that you're interested in. And as Holly mentioned, as I want to reiterate, not all universities will offer this funding to international students. So it's gonna be really important that when you're looking for funding, that you check to make sure that the university that you're applying to offers this aid to international students. Because what we don't want to happen, as Holly said, is for you to be accepted to your dream university and then come to us and say, I've got this acceptance letter, but I'm not sure how I'm going to pay for it. Um, they don't actually offer funding to international students. Um, and so that's why we're, we want to make that really clear right now to make sure that you're doing the research now to make sure that they not only offer uh, aid to international students, but that they're able to cover the full cost of um, what your family would need. So that's university funded. And then this is an example of from Rice University in Texas. Um, that I want to just show you a little bit more about everything that I've been talking about so far. So this is the Rice financial aid page. And you'll see here that it gives you a breakdown of not just tuition and room and board, but it also includes fees, books, and personal expenses such as flights home. And another really great tool on the Rice University website is their net price calculator. And that can help you find out how much need-based aid you might be able to receive. So um, universities like Rice University, and I've seen it on other universities as well, actually have tools where you can enter in some information about your family. And you can see based on that, um, an estimate of what your family might be expected to pay and what you might be expected to receive in aid if you were admitted to the university. So that can be a really useful tool in your research process. You can also find information about merit scholarships and the types of recipients. If you look here uh, at Rice University's page, they've integrated merit scholarships into their admissions process. So they say that all admitted freshman applicants are automatically considered for merit-based scholarships. And so there's no separate application forms or interviews um, at, at Rice, which is really cool. 
Rice also has a page with funding information specifically for international students. And you can see in this box here that international students are considered for need-based aid and that 100% of demonstrated need is met with grant aid. So they use something called the CSS profile to gather information about a student's financial background to determine that financial aid package. And as I said, it'll be important to check each university website and if funding is available for international students. All right, um, another source of aid is external funding bodies. And these may include a wide range of professional, charitable, or government organizations external to the university. And they can be thought of as niche scholarships because they have specific criteria based on the mission of the funding body. So for example, if you are from a particular country of origin or a particular ethnicity, maybe a certain religious faith, or you have an interest in a particular field or a certain interest or a talent, um, there might be a scholarship available for you related to that. So for instance, if you are a woman who is interested in engineering, there is likely a scholarship out there for women engineers. So if you are unique in any way, there's likely a funding body with a scholarship out there for you. You just have to find it. Um, one example of a really great scholarship that's available to in the US is something called the, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship. And this is a four year fully funded educational experience for students of the highest caliber at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And they are looking for students who have qualities of leadership, character, scholarship, and physical vigor for the scholarship. And they select students from the UK for this every year for a fully funded um, four year educational experience at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So as you can see, there are opportunities out there. You just have to be willing to kind of search for them and be flexible with, with what you're looking for um, and with your, um, yeah, with your choices. There are thousands of funding bodies, so searching will require time and dedication to sift through scholarship listings and to submit separate applications to each body. And so for this reason, we do encourage students to first apply for funding from universities and then for external funding. Um, and we do have web, oh, links on our website for scholarship search engines if you need a good place to start. So in terms of kind of a funding strategy, um, there's a few different approaches that you can take. First, you might want to consider the cost of living uh, in terms of where you're applying in the US. As you might imagine, in the UK, it is much more expensive to live in London than it is to live in Lancaster. Uh, similarly, in the US, it's more expensive to live in New York or California than it is to live in Ohio or Georgia. So that's something that you might want to consider if you're applying to some a university where the cost of living is lower than you will have lower fees related to the cost of living. You might just also choose to apply to a university where the cost of tuition is lower. As I mentioned, there's no set fees in the US, and so the, the price of tuition can really vary. And so you might just decide that you're going to apply to a university where the tuition is lower. And then finally, um, there are all these different sources of funding that we've talked about um, that you can help to use to fund your studies. And as I mentioned earlier, it's likely that you will use a variety of all of the different sources, family funds, university funding, external funding bodies, and then loans as a last resort as well. And so that's something to keep in mind that it might not be that there's one way that funds your entire studies, but they're using a combination of all those different sources. I also wanted to talk a little bit about community colleges. It might be something that you've never heard of before or something that maybe you've heard mentioned, but you don't know much about. And community colleges are actually an increasingly popular choice in the US as an alternative pathway that can help save a lot of money. Um, they generally award associate's degrees, which is not a degree offered here in the UK, but is a degree that um, often has a professional and vocational focus. Um, and they also have programs that allow students to do a two plus two transfer pathway. And what that means is that you would, oops, sorry, what that means is that you would start your studies at a community college, and then you would uh, get your associates after two years, and then transfer to a four-year institution, um, and do another two years, and then you would graduate with a bachelor's degree from that institution. Uh, and a lot of community colleges have transfer agreements with four-year institutions. So for instance, 
uh, Los Angeles Valley College that you see here on the screen it is a two-year community college that has a partnership with universities like UCLA, University of Southern California, and Cal Poly. Um, as just a personal example, my husband went to community college first. He did two years and earned his associates. He was able to stay at home and save on the cost of living. And then he worked and actually paid his community college fees from, from working. And then he transferred to DePaul University where I attended and did an additional two years and earned his bachelor's at DePaul. And he was able to come out of university with a significantly um, lower amount of student loans than a lot of other uh, of my friends because he started at that community college with the, with the significantly lower fees that he was able to pay off while working at the same time. Um, and that's something to know is that community college is much less expensive than four-year universities. And you can save thousands by paying the significantly lower tuition of a community college for two of the four years. Another benefit is that they have smaller class sizes, which can be really valuable for the introductory classes at university. Um, and it means that you have more contact with professors. Another thing to keep in mind is that they generally involve less rigorous application processes and entry requirements than a four-year university. Um, and many of them don't require any kind of admissions exam scores for admission either. And something really cool about community colleges that I actually learned recently myself is that once you finish your associates um, of your two years, you can actually do um, the OPT, which is the it's what gives you the opportunity to work in the US for a year. Um, and so you could do that for a year and then transfer to a, a four year university to complete your bachelor's, do the two years there, and then you would get another OPT visa to work for an additional year. So you actually get the opportunity to have two different um, OPTs to work for two years at separate times in the US, as opposed to if you go to the US um, all the way through for your four-year bachelor's, you just get the one OPT at the end. So kind of a cool perk of going to the college. So just some final funding tips. Um, as we've said, start early, include it in your research process from the very beginning. Um, be really flexible in choosing your universities um, and um, think about ways that you're going to stand out as an applicant. I would really think about, are you only applying to universities that you are <clears throat> certain are going to have dozens of other, <clears throat> excuse me, dozens of other students from the UK applying? Or are you applying to universities that might actually have very few, or maybe you're the only one applying from the UK where your application is really going to stand out. And they might say, oh, we've got this applicant from the UK and they, we don't have anybody else applying like that. So you'll really want to kind of think about that when doing your research and thinking about funding. All right, so now that we've talked about funding, I want to kind of take you through the basics of completing an application. So I quickly just kind of want to talk about what uh, US universities are looking for in your application. And the first thing they're going to be looking for, first and foremost, is your academics, which are going to be demonstrated by the, your kind of final four years of schooling before attending university. So if you are in um, England, Northern Ireland, or Wales, they're gonna be looking at those GCSEs any, and any A-levels. If you're in Scotland, they're going to be looking at those national fives, hires, advanced hires. Um, and so looking at any results that you've received as well as any predictions. And that's going to kind of be the most important part of your application. But that's not going to be the only part of your application. And having great academics doesn't guarantee you a spot at a U.S. university. They're also going to be looking at the, the holistic picture, the whole version of you. And some of the ways that they're going to do that is first by looking at your academic fit for their university. Throughout your application, you're gonna have the opportunity to say why it is that you want to apply to their university. And they want to really see that coming through in your, in your application. So for instance, let's say you're applying to NYU and you write this essay and it's all about how much you love New York, why you want to be in New York, how New York is going to make your dreams come true. Somebody at NYU might be saying, okay, I know why they love New York, but they could be at any university in New York. I'm not seeing why they want to be here at NYU. And so in your application, it's going to be really important to show that you've done your research, that you've decided that this university is a good fit for you, and that you're explaining why. 
Is it that there's a particular program at the university, that there's a particular extracurricular activity? Does the mission of the university really speak to you? They want to see that coming through in your application. And then, as I said, they're going to be looking at a holistic version of you. And so one of the ways that they do that is they, they will ask you for information on your extracurriculars. What do you do outside of the classroom? And they will use that information to kind of get a sense of who you are and what, what it is that you're interested in and what kinds of personal attributes and traits that you might bring to their campus. So to talk a little bit more about what the components of the application are, I'll talk kind of go through this part really briefly and then go through some of these parts in more depth. So first, there's going to be the actual application form that kind of has your basic demographic information, name, email, all that kind of stuff. Then there's going to be um, admissions exam scores if required. Not all universities will require this, especially at the moment with COVID. I'll talk about this a bit more in a little bit. Then you'll have a transcript, which is a document um, that your school will provide that provides information on any results from any exams that you've sat, as well as any predictions. You'll also submit two to three essays. You'll also be asking for recommendation letters from teachers and people at your school. And then of course, there will be an application fee of about 50 to $100 per application. Although some universities will have fee waivers and that is something that you could potentially apply for. Um, and as mentioned earlier, there is no kind of centralized UCAS system in the US. And so you will kind of have to do um, each application separately. They do have a system called the Common Application, which is used by, I think, about 900 universities. And so if you're applying to universities that use the Common Application, you will be able to kind of use that to at least kind of have the same basic details listed, um, have an essay that's included in the Common Application. But even within that Common Application system, the university might ask for additional supplemental essay questions or additional questions that you have to answer. And universities won't necessarily have the same deadlines um, or the same requirements. And so it's going to be really important to just kind of do your research and to kind of track when each deadline is, what the requirements are, and make sure that you're meeting those. All right, so to speak just a little bit more about admissions tests, um, the very first thing that I want to say is that you admissions tests might not be required at the institutions where you're applying, especially with COVID at the moment. A lot of institutions in the US have made admissions exams optional. And so you are going to want to do research first and foremost to see if an exam is even required. And if it is not required, it might be that you choose not to take an exam, save the money, save the time that you would spend, spend revising for that exam, and instead take, spend that time doing your research, putting together a really strong application. That being said, it might be that the universities where you want to apply um, are requiring the exam, or you might decide that it's something that you would like to submit as part of your application, and that's fine. And so if that's the case, I'm going to talk just a little bit more about what those admissions exams are um, and how you can go about doing that. So first of all, the reason that they exist in the first place is because in the US, there's no national curriculum at the secondary school level. And so as a way to evaluate applicants from diverse areas and schools, they've created these standardized tests, um, admissions tests for this purpose to kind of be able to look at students from across the US when there is no national curriculum. Um, and there's two exams, the SAT or the ACT. Universities will accept either of them. Um, and they are both multiple choice exams that you sit under time conditions that test in areas like verbal reasoning, reading, math. Um, what we would recommend if you are hoping to take an exam is that in deciding which exam it is you're going to take, that you go online and find a free mock exam and take one of each um, under times conditions and just see which one you do better in. And that's the one that you should take. That's the, and, and then you should study for it. Um, you'll want to make sure that you book that, that test in advance, um, that you that you book the test date, and, and then you will submit those scores to the university. And we would recommend if you are planning to take those exams, you will kind of want to take that exam um, the kind of like 10 to 12 months before enrollment. And so 
if you are planning to enroll in kind of autumn of 2022, then you'd be wanting to look to take those exams this summer or kind of early autumn um, before the, the half term break um, so that you have those exam scores in hand for your application this autumn. Transcripts. So as I mentioned earlier, this is a document that will be submitted by your school that has a listing of your academic qualifications. Um, so it's just uh, your school will submit it if they've never helped a student apply to a US university before and they don't know how to create a document like this. We actually have templates available on our website that they can use. And basically it will include your name, it will include the, the years that you've attended the school, and then it's going to include information on any exam results. So again, GCSEs, if you're from England, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, as well as any A-level predictions. Um, and then if you're from Scotland, those national fives, as well as hires and advanced hires. Um, this is generated by your school. They, your school may also submit a school report to a US university. And this is just a report um, providing information about the school to a US university. So just saying how many students you have, where you're located, uh, what types of subjects are available at your school, that kind of information. And again, we have information about this on our website. So if your school needs help in creating any of these documents, don't hesitate to send them our way and we can help them. You're also going to submit recommendation letters as part of your US university application. And these can be used as a marketing tool for you as an applicant. You're going to want to make sure that you choose people who know you really well. So people who know you well, um, both in and out of the classroom uh, that can talk to your strengths in the classroom, but also maybe any extracurricular involvement that you have at school. Um, and so choose wisely. Uh, we really recommend that you meet with the person in advance and talk to them about what it is, um, why it is that you want to go to the US, um, you know, what you're hoping to do. You might even provide them with some specific examples of things that they can include in their recommendation letter. Um, maybe there's a specific instance of a moment in their class um, that, that really stood out to you that you felt like you did a particularly good job and you can remind them of that and ask that, you know, let them know it might be something they want to include in their letter. And one of the things that I want to say about re recommendation letters is that it's really important that you encourage your referees to write enthusiastically. Um, in the U.S., it is not uncommon for referees to kind of be a bit over the top, very enthusiastic. So what we don't want is any kind of modesty or reserve um, being in these recommendation letters. We want them to be very enthusiastic and, and kind of really showing you off and showing you how great you are. So this is something that you want to keep in mind and that you're going to, when you meet with your referee, kind of want to discuss and remember, remind them that they're going to have an American audience reading these letters and that they should write appropriately. And, and now I'd like to talk about essays. So this is actually one of the most important parts of the application process for undergraduate study in the US. And a strong essay can really set you apart from other applicants and gives you an opportunity to showcase yourself to a university. Um, so as I said earlier, you know, the academics are gonna be a really strong part of your application. But if everybody who's applying to the university has really strong um, academics, how are they going to kind of differentiate between which ones they should choose to come to their university? And the essay can play a really big part of that. Now, the essay for a U.S. university is not like your UCAS personal statement. Rather than submitting an explanation of your interests and achievements in a particular field of study, as you would via UCAS, you'll be asked to respond to between one and three essay questions on a US university application. Each university will set its own questions as well as their desired length for the response. However, as I mentioned earlier, um, the common app system is used by a lot of universities. And this system includes, I think about seven questions. Um, so if you're applying to any universities through the common app system, um, you will write one kind of um, main, main essay that will be submitted to all the universities that you apply to through that system. And just to give you an example of um, a couple of questions that might be uh, asked through the common application system and how it differs from 
a UK essay. One example is reflect on a time when you questioned or challenged a belief or idea. What prompted your thinking? What was the outcome? Another example is describe a topic, idea, or concept you find so engaging that it makes you lose all track of time. Why does it captivate you? What or who do you turn to when you want to learn more? So as you can see, these types of prompts really will give a US admissions officer reading your application an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and maybe see something, learn something about you that they haven't seen anywhere else in the application. So your essay is really going to be an opportunity for that. It's unlikely that you'll be able to compose one essay that will answer all the different questions by multiple universities, but you might be able to reuse elements of essays for different universities. And then these are just some, some writing tips, making sure that you're answering the question fully, that you're avoiding vague or empty statements, um, cliches or cultural references that might not translate well to a US audience. If you do decide to reuse an essay, be, be really sure that you're using the name, the correct name of the university in that, in that essay. You don't want to apply to ABC University saying, I really want to come to XYZ University because that would not be a good look. Um, make sure that you proofread extensively and that you ask others to, to proofread and offer their feedback. And most importantly, be yourself. Don't give the admissions officers the answers that you think they want to hear, give them the truth. Um, think about what sets you apart and let your personality come through in the essay. Um, there's more tips on our website about this that you can check out. And on our website, we also have links to different university pages where they actually publish examples of essays that students at their university used when they applied. Um, and those that can be really good for just getting a sense of what an application essay might look like and how it might be different to a UK uh, personal statement. So that's a very brief overview of the, well, a, a brief but a slightly more in-depth overview of the application process to a U.S. university. So now I just kind of quickly want to mention other opportunities to go to the U.S. and other opportunities in the U.S. Um, so there are a few different opportunities if you decide that a full undergraduate degree in the U.S. is not for you. Um, you could choose to go to the U.S. while at a U.K. university through a university exchange program. Many UK universities have established exchange programs with US universities or US-based study abroad programs. So for instance, I was on the University of Manchester website today, and I noticed that they have partnerships with 18 different universities in the US. Um, this could be logistically simpler, uh, a logistically simpler way of going to the US because your university will help you arrange it all. Um, we, you also have a variety of different summer institutes. Uh, the study of the U.S. Institutes for Student Leaders are intensive short-term academic programs whose purpose is to provide groups of undergraduate student leaders with a, with a deeper understanding of the United States while simultaneously enhancing their leadership skills. Um, so that's one program that's available. Or if you really love America, you can spend three years studying it. Um, you might choose to pursue an American Studies degree at university, and they often or incorporate a year in the U.S. as well. There's also internships or summer work, like going um, working for Camp America, or alternatively, you might decide that undergraduate study in the US is not for you, but maybe postgrad study is. And if that's the case, we will still be here down the line to help you with that, if that's something that you decide to do. Uh, we also, on our website, have information about Fulbright awards that are available for funding postgraduate study. And with that, I'm going to hand back over to Holly, who's going to talk about some more ways that we at Education USA and the US UK Fulbright Commission can help. Thanks, Sarah. So, next slide, please. First off, one of the ways we might be able to help you is through um, the Sutton Trust US program. So in partnership with the social mobility program in the UK, which is called the Sutton Trust. This program is for students who are in year 12 or equivalent and are very high achieving and come from low income families. Um, this program supports students through the process of applying to undergraduate study in the USA. And as part of it, um, when we're able to, with, you know, 
travel restrictions and things like that also in, involves a visit to US universities during the summer between your last two years of secondary education. Um, perhaps the best part about this programme is that it is free for all admitted students. And so if you are interested in learning more about this and checking if you would be eligible to apply, you can go ahead and find more information on our website. Speaking of our website, on this next slide, we've talked about it a lot this evening, but it really is a wonderful resource to learn more about US study. You'll find a lot of the information that we've talked about this evening, along with additional external links that will help you. So if you actually go up to the Going to the USA tab at the top, of the website or at the top of the screen, it will bring up a going to the USA section. Under that, you'll find our undergraduate guide with lots of detail on choosing, funding and applying. And I'll also for ease add a link in the chat to that section. Next slide. We also um, take questions via phone and via email. So if any, anything's unclear after this evening or you'd like to get in touch to clarify something, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. You can also, if you've got a more specific set of circumstances or you'd like prefer to talk something through on a Zoom call with us, uh, you can book in a one-to-one -one video appointment with an advisor. These tend to take place on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons. And again, our booking system can be found on our website in our contact page. All of you who are tuning in this evening are already doing a great job at attending some of these, but we host events about studying in the US online and in person when we're able to. Um, this one has been more general about undergraduate study in the US, uh, but we also do have more thematic uh, webinars such as on sports scholarships like in the picture, but you know, women's colleges, HBC News, whatever it may be. So look out for those on our website. One event in particular that I'd like to highlight is USA College Day, which takes place annually at the end of September. This year, we will be hosting it virtually um, and it is a completely free event to attend. And what it is, is that more than 170 US universities attend this fair. And these are universities that are specifically interested in connecting with UK students and getting more international students to come to their campuses. Um, and so it's a chance to learn more about different colleges and universities and really help with that choosing and research process that I was talking about earlier on in the presentation. And so if that's of interest to you, save the date for the 25th of September and also have a look on our website to register to attend that event. Um, attendee registration will open in late August but you can actually sign up to be notified when registration goes live now on our website. Okay, so without further ado, we are now going to open the floor to your questions. Um, and I'll give everyone a moment to just, you know, pop into the, into the Q&A box any questions that have come up. Uh, I can see that there are a couple here already so I guess we'll get started with those. Um, so we have had one question from a student in Scotland, Sarah, um, who has just finished their higher exams and is wondering whether hires would be, you know, with hires it would be okay to apply with these exam results alone. Um, and then we've kind of covered this part of the question off as whether you would need to have an ACT or an SAT exam score to accompany those. Um, because of course, many colleges have gone test optional in light of COVID. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I would say that that's going to depend on the university. And so what you'll want to do is kind of look, because each university has a different policy with regards to kind of test optional, it, it, there's a lot of universities that kind of won't require the SATs at all. Um, there's some universities that might accept those higher exams in place of, of an SAT if they do require an SAT. And so it is going to be a matter of kind of doing, doing the research and, and to taking a look at some universities to see what, what the case will be depending on the university. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Holly? No, I think that sounds good. Um, I'd also say, 
um, some US universities will just kind of vary with Scottish qualifications in particular in as to whether they um, would be fine to accept students directly who've just done hires. But sometimes we'll be looking for a mixture of hires and advanced hires. So you, if you are unsure at any point, I'd recommend just reaching out directly to the international admissions officer at the universities that you're interested in, just to double check what is required on that front. But I think Sarah's right. The universities are going to vary in what this looks like. And so that's why we just highlight that importance of doing your research. So another question that we've had is, can you explain how recommendation referees are used in a bit more depth? And yeah. Yeah, sure. I can start off. And then if you want to add anything, Sarah, that is absolutely fine. Um, so as Sarah was talking about in her section about putting together an application, you'll have got the sense that unlike here in the UK, where there is a slightly more focus on sort of your objective, you know, this is your GCSE and A-level scores, and these are all the things that you've done related to the subject that you're ultimately going to study. The US admissions process is a lot more holistic, and US universities are wanting to get a sense of you as a whole, and within the context and background that you're coming from. And so the teacher recommendations and the counsellor recommendations are a real great opportunity for, it's another data point essentially for US universities to really get a sense of who you are, what you're passionate about. And what Sarah was saying about getting referees who know you both inside and outside of the classroom is a really important factor because they're going to add a di different dimension and, and a different viewpoint to your, uh, to complement the rest of your application essentially. Is there anything you'd like to add, Sarah? Um, I, got, I guess I think that the only other thing that I would add is in terms of choosing who is going to provide your referee. Um, there's, there's a couple of different references that are usually required at a US university. So one is going to be something that's called a counselor recommendation. Um, and in the, the US, a high school typically has um, a counselor that kind of does this position. Um, in the UK, the position doesn't usually exist in the, in the same way. And so typically somebody who might write a counselor recommendation in the UK might be kind of like a head of sixth form or a head of careers, somebody like that. And a counselor recommendation is really going to give a perspective of the students um, in the context of the, the school as a whole. So kind of looking really more widely as the students, like how they contribute to the school environment, um, their extracurriculars, kind of what they're involved in. And then in addition to that counselor recommendation, the university is usually gonna require one or two teacher recommendations. And those teacher recommendation letters are gonna be more focused on the student within the classroom. And so you're usually going to want to choose for those recommendations, somebody who's teaching uh, one of your A-level subjects or one of your higher or advanced higher subjects to kind of write that recommendation letter for you. And they'll be able to kind of provide you much more of an insight of what you're like as a student in the classroom. Um, and they might also include some of how um, the extracurriculars that you're involved in might be related to, you know, you go above and beyond the work in the classroom through one of your extracurricular activities and that might be included as well, but it'll be much more classroom focused, whereas the counselor letter might kind of focus more on you as a student within the, the school environment. Great. Um, I think we have gotten to all of the questions so far. If anyone has got any additional questions, Sarah and I will hang around for a couple more minutes just to see if any come through. Um, but as we mentioned earlier on, if you do have any questions that perhaps, you know, you want to take in this evening's information, have a think about them, have a look on our website, you can always get in touch with us via email, phone call or setting up an, an appointment with one of us as well.